Welcome to Verbals and Beyond. When is a verb not a verb? Now you may say, that sounds like a stupid joke, Mr. Bear. That's like, when is a door not a jaw? When it's a jar, ha ha ha. Well, there is really certain intelligence behind this question, and it's not a joke. A verb is not a verb when it is a verbal. So, that's nice, Mr. Bear. What is a verbal? A verbal is a verb used in a sentence as a different part of speech. Verbals can be adjectives, nouns, or adverbs, depending on the situation and the type of verbal that it is. In fact, if you think about it, that word depending is a verbal. It comes from the verb to depend, but it is not the verb of the sentence. It doesn't have a subject. Uh, and you know, the verb is can be. It's a linking verb, actually. So that would be an example of a verbal. You can recognize a verbal because it has the form of the verb, but it is not the verb or simple predicate of the sentence. Verbals can be very useful because they do retain certain traits of regular verbs. They can have complements, just like verbs. Occasionally, they may have a subject. They are commonly found in phrases. So yeah, that's why they're part of the phrase unit. And in England, I mean in English, that's goes America too, in English there are three kinds of verbals. And today we're going to look at one kind, usually the first kind, and that is the participle. The first verbal we'll be studying is the participle. A participle is a form of the verb that acts as an adjective. Okay, a participle is always an adjective, but it's formed from the verb. And there are two kinds of participles, the past participle and the present participle. And they each have a different form. The past participle is in the past form of the verb and acts as an adjective. The past participle is the form of the verb that would be found with the verb to have in a verb phrase. Normally, they end in ed, but there are, in English, many irregular past participles. So, regular past participles we have here, like walk. The past participle is walked, you add an ed. Play, past participle is uh, played, you add an ed. Bake, past participle is baked, you add a d. Uh, you always ends in a d, you have to follow the spelling rule. In the first two cases, you add an ed with bake, you just add a D. Sometimes you, like in uh, hop, becomes hopped, or stopped, becomes stopped. You uh, double the final consonant before adding an ED. So I keep the spelling rules, but it ends in ED. But we know in English there are numerous irregular past participles. Past participle of buy is bought. Past participle of go is gone. Past participle of be is been. So, yeah, we would say have bought, have gone, or have been, if we were using them in a verb phrase. Okay, so that's what past participle is. Okay, here we have past participle in a sentence. Beaten beyond recognition by robbers, the man was left on the Jericho Road. Okay, beaten is the past participle. It's the past form of the verb, to beat, but it modifies the man. It doesn't tell us what the man was doing. The man was left. That's what he was doing, or what was done to him. But 
you know, beaten modifies man. Okay. Why isn't left the past participle in this sentence? Because left is part of the main verb. Was left is the main verb. Man was left. Okay. Here are some past participles in other sentences. Okay, we had this one already, beaten beyond recognition. Notice this, satisfied, he refused second. Okay. He refused, he is a subject, refused is the verb, the main verb, but satisfied is an adjective describing he. In what condition was he? He was satisfied. Okay. Ends in ED, past participle. Jesus, crucified between two thieves, fulfilled a number of prophecies from the manner of his death. Crucified modifies Jesus. It's a past participle. Describes Jesus. The main verb is fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. But crucified describes him. Jesus is the risen Lord. Here we have an irregular past participle. We say he was risen or he is risen. He has risen. And risen modifies Lord. Again, it's an adjective describing Lord. So these are examples of past participles. Now the other kind of participle is the present participle. Present participles are very regular. They always end in ing according to the appropriate spelling rule and they act as adjectives in the sentence. So present participle always ends in ing. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to change the final letter. Uh, sometimes you, you know, double the final consonant or something like that. I mean, there are different spelling rules, but, you know, they always end in ing. Um, acting as an adjective in a sentence, a present participle always ends in ing. And notice here, the word acting is a present participle. It modifies the word participle. It's, you know, describing participles, acting as an adjective. You know, uh, the, the main verb is, of course, ends, participle ends. Okay. So, there's a present participle and an example of one. Okay. Paying no attention to his disciples' objections, Jesus headed for Jerusalem. Here, paying is the present participle. Modifies Jesus. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me nine ladies dancing. Dancing modifies ladies. It is a present participle. Ends in ing. Okay? And on the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me four calling birds. Calling is an adjective of modifying birds. Ends in ing. Formed from the verb to call. Present participle. Remember, now, many times the verb of a sentence is made up of a verb ending in ing. But if that's the case, there will always be an auxiliary verb or auxiliary verbs if it is the verb. So, like, for example, in this sentence, where are you going? Are going is the verb. But, you know, it's a verb phrase. Are going. Looking for bargains, he was shopping online for hours. Okay, was shopping is the verb. Notice, looking is a present participle. Looking describes he. But was shopping is the main verb. Okay. And then, now, we knew this was a phrase unit after all, correct? Correct. So, this is participial phrase. A participial phrase, you can probably figure out, is a phrase made up of a participle with any complements and modifiers. Remember what I told you before. Verbals can have complements just like verbs do. Verbals may have complements. So, uh, now, here's one, beaten beyond recognition. Okay, the verbal is beaten. The verbal phrase is 
beaten beyond recognition by robbers. Okay? It's the participial phrase modifying the man. Okay. So, in this case, there is no compliment, but beyond recognition by robbers modify beaten, so they're part of the whole participial phrase. So yeah, you can have phrases within phrases. So in this case, you have two prepositional phrases within the participial phrase. Okay. Again, was left, as we said before, was the verb. Okay, beaten is a participle, the prepositional phrases beyond recognition, and by robbers, modified beaten, so they are part of the participial phrase. Okay, here's another one we saw before. Paying no attention to his disciples' objections, Jesus headed for Jerusalem. Okay, paying, we saw, is the present participle. Paying no attention to his disciples' objections is the whole participial phrase. Notice in this case we have a compliment. Attention is direct object. Paying what? Paying attention. Not paying money in this case, paying attention. Okay, so. Uh, so in this case, we have the direct, ob uh, direct object of the participle paying. Okay? And then, to his disciples' objections modifies the complement. I guess we could make a case, maybe it modifies paying. But I guess it really modifies attention. And then no, of course, modifies attention. So uh, we have the entire participial phrase, in this case, made up of the participle, its complement, and the modifiers associated with either the participle or the complement. Okay, again, as we pointed out before, headed is the main verb. Jesus did what? He headed. Okay, why isn't headed a participle? It's the main verb of the sentence. Notice, in this case, as I mentioned, uh, the word attention is the direct object of paying. Okay, appearing wise beyond his years, Jesus carried on a conversation with the elders in the temple. Okay, in this case, appearing is the participle, it's a present participle. Appearing wise beyond his years is the participial phrase, okay? And then, appearing in this case, is a linking verb, as it says. The participle here is a linking verb. So it has, in this case, a predicate adjective. Wise is a predicate adjective. Okay? Appearing wise. Yeah. So, um, it's a predicate adjective of the linking verb participle. So a different kind of complement. Okay? And again, uh, here's another example. We had this sentence before. Uh, acting is the um, present participle. Acting as an adjective in a sentence would be the participial phrase. Uh, in this case, as an adjective and in a sentence or both. Um, uh, prepositional phrases modifying acting. So, uh, again, we'll see more examples of participial phrases. Okay. Now, I do want to mention this. Your book does this differently, but I just want to mention it. Some authorities recognize a third type of participle, what they call the perfect participle. Okay, a perfect participle is made up of the word having plus one or more past participles. So, if we rewrote this sentence to say, having paid no attention to his disciples' objections, Jesus would head for Jerusalem. If we change the tenses a little bit, um, you know, some people would say, having paid is a perfect participle. Now, your book simply considers this the same as a present participle, okay? They would just say, it's a present participle having with uh, 
you know, uh, you know followed by um, basically another participle. Uh, your book simply considers this the same as a present participle. But if when you're reading or something, you know, you come across the term perfect participle, you know what it is. It won't be on your homework or anything, but you do know what that is. Okay. Uh, there is one very distinct form uh, in which you find participials, participial phrases are just sometimes individual participles, uh, modifying a noun in a noun phrase known as a nominative absolute. The nominative absolute is a noun phrase which is mod modified by a participle or participial phrase which has no direct grammatical relationship to the main clause of the sentence. Okay, so it's a, uh, a noun, so it could be a pronoun, but usually a noun modified by a participle or participial phrase. And that phrase has meaning, but it doesn't have a direct grammatical connection with the main part of the sentence. It's normally set off by commas. Usually it's found at the beginning of a sentence. You can't place it at the end or even in the middle, but it is usually found at the beginning of a sentence. And let me give you some examples of nominative absolutes. The nominative absolute, okay. His work on earth done, Jesus returned to the Father. Notice um, this phrase, his work on earth done. This is a nominative absolute. This is a noun phrase, okay? Work is a noun, and it's the main word of this phrase. Done is a participle modifying work, okay? So this phrase here, this noun phrase, is a nominative absolute. Notice that it does not have any grammatical connection with the rest of the sentence. Just as Jesus returned to the Father, you know, work done, Jesus returned. Okay, but, um, you know, there is, this is, doesn't have a grammatical relationship. His work on earth done doesn't modify anything. It's a noun. It's not in a positive because it's not renaming anything. It's giving us different information. So we call this a nominative absolute phrase. Okay. Um, again, not real common, but it is a construction in English, and we do run into them from time to time. Okay. Notice the introductory phrase. Its main word is a noun, the word work, which is modified by a participle, in this case, the word done. Okay, so... Uh, Anyway, the example of a nominative absolute. Okay, his soul satisfied, he sees the joy set before him. Once again, his soul satisfied, this phrase is a nominative absolute. Soul is the noun, the main part of the sentence. Satisfied is, the, in this case, the past participle, modifying soul. Okay, so this is a nominative absolute. Now notice the second one says virtually the same thing. It doesn't have a participle. Okay, instead of a participle, it has a regular adjective, uh, content. And you say, well, okay, that, is that really a nominative absolute? Well, yeah, the grammar books would say, yeah, it is a nominative absolute um, because it could be understood that there was the verb to be, or a linking verb understood. His, you could say it, his soul being content. Uh, and we would say, you know, being is, you know, understood. Uh, and so, um, it, would all, it is considered a nominative absolute, um, even though it doesn't have a participle in it. Okay. So, but you can see how the, the similarities between the two. Okay, notice in this case, 
we do have a normal prepositional phrase at the end. The joy set before him. Here, set is, you know, past participle, modifying joy, and then before him modifies set, okay? Um, notice that we could, if we wanted to, write that first nominative absolute we have with the verb to be, if we wanted to. We could say his work on earth being done, Jesus returned to the Father. So, um, uh, in a lot of cases, the, uh, not, not all cases, especially with present participles, but with most past participles, you could have uh, the present participle of the verb to be in there if you wanted to, such, such as we have in, in this case. But it, it basically means the same thing without the word being. Okay, so let's review what we've learned in this lesson. A verbal is a verb acting as a different part of speech. A participle is a verb acting as an adjective, modifying nouns or pronouns. Note the participles in this sentence, in these sentences. Acting is a participle. It's an um, adjective modifying verb. It's present participle, ends in ing. And then as a different part, acting as a different part of speech is the whole participial phrase. Okay, participle, and again, here, we have the participle acting, acting as an adjective and modifying. Acting as an adjective, modifying nouns and pronouns. Notice in this case, the um, second participial phrase, modifying nouns and pronouns, we have a compound direct object. Because modifying what? Nouns or pronouns. So nouns and pronouns are the direct object, not of the verb, because the main verb is a linking verb, doesn't have a direct object, but the uh, direct objects of the participle modifying. Okay, a participial phrase is a phrase made up of a participle, its complement, and any modifiers. So, you know, acting as a different part of speech is a participial phrase. Acting as an adjective is a participial phrase. Modifying nouns or pronouns is another participial phrase. Okay? And so, uh, again, as an adjective, it's a prepositional phrase. Modifying acting nouns or pronouns is a compound direct object. I mean, uh, you know, complementing, modifying. And as a different part of speech uh, to uh, prep, it contains two different prepositional phrases as a different part and of speech. But, you know, of speech modifies part, so the whole thing then modifies a, uh, acting. You know, it's, uh, you know, an adverbial prepositional phrase, acting how, acting as a part of speech. Okay. There are two kinds of participles, the past participle and the present participle. Past participles usually end in ed, but there are numerous irregular past participles. Uh, I think your literature book has about 70 in the section. It's a different section, not the section where you have these exercises, but a different section where it talks about the verb structure. Um, I think there's something, you know, it has about 70 different irregular verbs, and that covers a good many of them, but you can probably think of others. You know, past participle of break is broke. Uh, you know, so a lot of different ones. Anyway, uh, or broke in, I should say, not broke, broke in. Um, and then uh, past participles take the same form of the verb as the verb takes in a phrase following the verb to have. That's right, it's not have broke, it's have broke in but broken would be the past participle. And present participles, of course, always end in I-N-G. Okay. Remember, the main verb or simple predicate can have the same form as a participle, so do not confuse them. Remember, too, that participles, like verbs, can have complements, such as direct objects, predicate nominatives, 
predicate adjectives or objective complements. Okay? Um, they can have any one of those. We saw some with direct objects, uh, some with predicate adjective. We saw one with predicate adjective. Uh, if you have a linking verb, it could have a predicate nominative. And it's rare, but occasionally uh, you could have a participial phrase with a direct object and then an object complement uh, following the direct object. So, I Probably if you thought about it real hard, you could come up with a participial phrase that has an indirect object. That's pretty rare. I, I suppose it's possible, but it's pretty rare. No, I just thought about something. You know, having promised the disciples to return, Jesus ascended to heaven. Okay, I just thought of that. Okay, that you know, that would be an example of um, a uh, participial phrase with an indirect object. So it is possible. Okay, and then remember, nominative absolute is a noun phrase not otherwise grammatically collected to the rest of the sentence in which the noun is modified by a participle or a participial phrase. Sometimes in a nominative uh, absolute with the verb to be, the participle is understood but not used. Okay? So we saw you know, an example of that. The nominative ab absolutes are not real common, but they do occur in the English language and they make perfect sense to us, but you know, it is a different construction. That's all, folks, for today. Verbals, participles, present participles, past participles, participial phrases, nominative absolutes. And have fun with the homework.